Hey folks, it's 6.02 a.m. February the 3rd, 2018, I'm told. Today I'm going to continue talking about the problems with geography. Geography, as it's spelled out in the Old Testament, it's called the Hebrew Scriptures, the Bible. And... The geography as we are told today um, that it is. So we're, we're told today that the events in the Bible all uh, occurred, uh, for the most part, in and around this little strip of land on the uh, eastern coast of the Mediterranean called Palestine and uh, the claims of the Jews are that uh, they are the descendants of the Abram of the Bible and thus they have a right to uh, occupy that land. Uh, as far as they're concerned, Palestinians, Arabs, and all other manner of life already there that have been there as long as I guess anybody even knows of, be damned. And what I find amazing about that, because this is so multi-layered, is that most of the Western Christian world is behind them in this insanity, this absurd claim to this land. Aside from the fact that those who call themselves Jews uh, can't prove in any way, shape, or form their um, lineage from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> Even if they could, you have the issue of them having absolutely no right to that land. If that land were the land that the events of the Bible occurred in, they have absolutely no right to it. By their very actions, by the abominations of their most sacred scripture, which is not the Torah, it's not the Tanakh. It's not the Hebrew Scriptures. It's the Babylonian Talmud. That is their most sacred book of perversions. So even if they could prove that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were their fathers, and they never will because they can't, because they aren't, you have the issue, and I know I had to sit through a few minutes of a uh, Armstrongite, British Israelism Armstrongite, talk about the, the Jews being our brother Judah. It filled me with such a sickness. They can't. And they won't ever prove that their lineage is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If by some immense form of trickery and treachery, they did, well, then they still don't have a right to be in that land because they are utter 
fiends, criminals, liars. They worship Molech and Refam. Oh, and I know our ancestors Yisrael and our ancestors Yehuda. They were idolaters, too. But remember, there were many promises given throughout the Old Testament by Yahweh himself to Israel, to Yehuda, not the Jews, but the house of Judah, that he'd make a new covenant with us, that he would write his law on our hearts and put his commandments within us. And that certainly is not the Jews. They have no semblance of the laws of Yahweh within them, around them, nothing. So, if let's say you can get past all of that because you're either so sleepy or so deceived by your shepherds, your hireling shepherds who are just lazy dogs, not doing their job and being utterly irresponsible about what they have been commissioned to do. Let's say that you're still still deceived about those things. Well, I would ask you then to consider whether or not this, this place, Palestine, this geographical area, Palestine, Egypt, Lower Iraq, uh, what is today Syria, um, what is today Lebanon and, and and it's very funny too because mostly everybody should know where Ethiopia is right I want you to consider why they have to claim that there's two lands of Kush it should actually outrage anybody who loves reading the Bible loves the Word of God and holds it dear as the one and only trustworthy source of truth we have it should outrage you how much these translators have changed the names of places and geographical features in the Hebrew scriptures in fact if you start considering the um, underlying Hebrew, even in a manuscript that is a mixed manuscript, which is mostly what they publish for us to read, even if you should still see all of these great differences between the actual words and what they give us is a translation. There's a lot of excuses for this. And they'll tell you that uh, perhaps Greece called this place something else. And that's stuck. And that's why it's so different than it's recorded in the Bible. Prime example, Metzurim. You know, Metzurim. Ring any bells? The ER? The ER is some waterway. I, 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 I would think a river. I don't, I don't know for sure because I'm, I'm wading through so much confusion that man has piled onto the scriptures. But you know, Metzurim and the ER, right? 
because today it's in all our Bibles translated as Egypt and the Nile. And it's not translated that way consistently either, by the way. In Daniel 12, Daniel has a vision in Daniel 12. Or it's a continuation of the visions that he's having and being given by Gabriel in Daniel 11, starting at the end of Daniel 10. So in Daniel 12, he sees a man. Uh, it says he sees a man over a river. And it just says river. Um, I would that nearly any translation I can remember even looking at it's over the a, a river. Well, he sees a man over the yar. Now, see this yar. It it really you wouldn't think it's actually um just a another name for a river because like in English we have um, we have rivers and streams and brooks and creeks right we got we got all kinds of words to describe um a geographical feature that carries water we even have uh canals and and reservoirs um things like that which are more they're man-made now i can't tell you if the yar was more man-made or natural because every time you see Yar, it's in context with Matsurim, which is always translated as Egypt. But that man in Daniel 12, who is over the river, you look at the underlying Hebrew, he's standing over the Yar. For anybody who studies eschatology, and knows the importance of getting the facts right in uh, any eschatological study, I would think that would upset you. That you can't see when you read Daniel 12 and scratch your head trying to figure out what that vision's all about. You have no idea that that man is standing over a a waterway of some sort that is only always synonymous with Matsurim, translated always as Egypt. I hope this preamble has already made you extremely uncomfortable with uh, the so-called facts that were spoon-fed about the Bible. I want you to understand that just like there is a globe in nearly every classroom that we start out our educations in, in that same way, I was taught from the earliest ages that all of these events occurred in and around this place called Palestine. I was taught that so early that everything that I would a read in the Bible after that, my mind was automatically transported to this place in the Middle East. Now, they didn't tell me a whole lot about the Middle East, its geographical features. They didn't tell me a whole lot about Palestine and its geographical features. They didn't tell me a lot about Jerusalem, per se, uh, nor the city of David, which is Zion, it's Tzion, the same thing. But what they did tell me for sure was that all of these things happened in and around Palestine. And I'd like to believe that if it were true. I'd like to have an understanding, a greater, uh, deeper, uh, more intimate understanding of um, what the scriptures are conveying to me. Because I, I think these things are of the utmost importance. You know, even if you're, say, an atheist, I would think even an, an 
atheist who was, who claimed to be very honest and very sincere about wanting to find out the truth of things, would still have to hold uh, the Hebrew Scriptures in enough reverence due to the fact that they are so uh, integrated into the popular history of um, Western culture. If you're not even tipping your hat to that, I don't know where you end up in, in your searches for knowledge and, uh, and truth. So as I said in my last video, there... <laughs> I can't even convey to you <clears throat> how, how many uh, aspects of the geography of the Hebrew Scriptures don't jive with the geography of Palestine and the surrounding areas today. And I know I've heard the excuses. I've heard the excuses for <clears throat> why the land of Palestine doesn't look the way that when we read the Bible, let's just say topographically, uh, the flora and fauna doesn't quite seem to match. We're told a lot of stories about, well, the Romans cut down so many trees in Palestine. And obviously they would have had to have cut down so many trees everywhere they were just to do their crucifixion. If you believe that, you'd have to believe that the Romans, uh, the same people who seem to be really excellent builders, just their military, really great builders, it seems that they train them, their military in building. They built very well. It's said, that's a popular narrative, that these same people would have such a low value of trees as a building material, much less everything else that the presence of trees brings to life that is good, by the way, um, that they just summarily cut them down and use them for crucifixions everywhere. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know because, for one thing, there's been a group of people, I, I don't care who you want to believe they are, doesn't matter to me. You want to believe they're Jesuits, you want to believe they're Jews, you want to believe they're Jesuits. That's not as important right now as to know that there are signs that some group of intelligent beings have conspired to actually change the records of many nations and civilizations the world over. How much they did this, how much they succeeded, I don't know. I don't know. But in the last video, I mentioned, um, and man, I need this. I need this as a break from the language work I do. I mentioned that um, I didn't really, I wasn't really too sure. And not only about some of these sites in Palestine, but also about how they say that um, Nineveh, uh, Ninua, uh, the ancient site of Nineveh is near Masul on the Tigris River. The other claim is that um, Babylon or Babel 
uh, is down below in, uh, on the uh, Euphrates River, both being in uh, modern-day Iraq. And then that Persia um, would have been quite further away in, in what is now modern-day Iran. So I like to start at the beginning, whenever that's possible. I won't go really through the um, Gihon and the Pishon, although they are important. Well, actually, I will. I am going to talk a little bit about the Gihon, I'm sorry, but um, not the Pishon. The Pishon, uh, it says, compasses the whole land of uh, Haula and uh, gives descriptions of Haula too, which is really great because, of course, Yahweh thought of this because this is only, uh, Pishon is only mentioned one time right here in Genesis 2. Now, I want to make you aware that the word being used when it says, um, you see in English, it says uh, a river went out of Odin uh, to water the Gan or garden. Uh, that word right there, is ner it's an uh, n e r ner and i've been hesitant to even say for sure for sure for sure that it's a river but I, i'm mostly convinced that it is but here's the problem i just want to tell you about okay there's another word that's really common it's used a lot throughout the hebrew scriptures and it's always translated as mountain, or mount, or, or hill at least. And that word is air, E-R, air. Um, of course, most people who believe in the Masoretic uh, coding of the Hebrew scriptures would pronounce it as har. You think of things like har Megiddo, right? Har. That's where we get Armageddon, the title. Armageddon, because... Um, it would be a, uh, in my opinion, not a good transliteration of Har Megiddo, the hill of Megiddo, which is strange because you would think they would be in the valley of Megiddo. And there's no way that big armies that we're talking about, like world armies, can hardly even fit in that valley. Uh, if Megiddo is really the, the right place, the Megiddo of today is the right place, I, I don't think that is, by the way. Anyways, that's where it comes from. Air, E-R. Well, this word used as river coming out of Eden is ner. It's just an N at the front. And these are some of the mysteries about the language that I'm still pondering. Is How is it that this N-E-R, which is called nun he rush how that's river, but you take that so-called noon away, and you've got ER, and that's mountain. It's perplexing. So two things, okay? The uh, In Genesis 2.14, it says um, the name of the third river that came out of uh, Gan Oden is Hagkol. That's what it is. That's why I floated my mouse over it. Hadquil. Now, using Esword, I'm going to do a quick search for Hadquil in the Old Testament. Let's see what results I get. Oh, I get two results. One is the one I just looked at. The second is Daniel 10.4. Um, this portion of Daniel is in Hebrew. Um, they say that from Daniel 2.4 to Daniel 7.28 was in Aramaic. I don't know if that's true, but I guess that's what we have, right? So Daniel 10.4, and, uh, and the 4 and 20th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great Nair, <laughs> which is Hadquil. 
Daniel. Daniel was, um, of course, one of the uh, early prisoners that um, Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem back to Babylon. And he ended up uh, being in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. And he ended up working for him, being an official. He actually ended up being a, an official in the empire of Cyrus and the Persians. So by the time we get to, to Daniel 10, would have had to have been, <clears throat> we're going to check, um, this is the one thing that I like Esword for is the the ease of which I can I can jump around in it as opposed to uh, Q Bible. It's not as easy to jump around in. Oh, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, but. The time appointed was long, and he understood the thing, and had understanding of the vision. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the fourth and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hadquil, <clears throat> Excuse me. And what they do is, they tell us that Hodquil is the Tigris. Okay? And they tell us that Nineveh was on the Tigris. <coughs> well, I, I've done uh, reference searches on Nineveh. Nineveh, and uh, it doesn't once say that uh, Nineveh or Nineveh was uh, on the Hadquil or the Tigris. Genesis ten eleven's first reference: Out of that land went forth Asher, and builded Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth and Kala. And then Genesis ten twelve: And reason between Nineveh. And Kala, that's another city, the same as a great city. Oh, where's the runes of reason? Now, you have to jump all the way forward to 2 Kings 19.36. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, uh, departed and went, returned, and dwelt at Nineveh. Isaiah 37.37. A, uh, a lot of text between Isaiah and kings are almost virtually the same, because this was about the time when Isaiah lived. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. doesn't give us any information about the river where it's located or anything else. But it certainly does seem that Nineveh was, um, or Assyria, yep, same, same, right? Was to the north, seems. Let's go on. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. That's in Jonah. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, preach unto it, preaching that I bid thee. Jonah arose, went to Nineveh, according to the word of Yahweh. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days' journey. It's a big city, right? He began to enter into the city a day's journey. He cried, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The people of Nineveh believed God, and proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least. Now, remember that Jonah, this is, I'm going to give you, this is the, this is the mainstream story, okay? Is that he left, <coughs> he left Joppa here in a ship, and a great sea creature swallowed him, and puked him up on dry land. And then he went to Nineveh, now it said an exceedingly great city. Three days journey. Now, from where he got thrown up, I think what that's saying is that it's three days 
to cross one side of Nineveh to the other side. That's how big of a city it was. For real. I think that because um, in Jonah 3, 4, it says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. Okay, so he had gone a day's journey thus far into the city, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, I don't have a clue as to how many people were living in this place, but it was a lot. It was a lot. I mean, really. Because Yahweh says, he gives us a good idea. Because he says in Jonah 4.11, Should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. That's the weird thing for me, was also much cattle. That's Jonah 4.11. I gotta check on that cattle, because that could be one of the places where it's the word he, as opposed to bema. That, that's, those are all awful translations, too. Because you got to think, you all right, so you're telling me that he's saying, shouldn't I spare it, that has all these, basically he's saying a lot of innocent little kids who haven't f done anything wrong yet. They're, they're so little. They don't even know their right hand from their left. And it says, and then much cattle. I wouldn't think he would put the two on par with one another. Anyways, so that's 120,000 children so young they don't even know the right hand from their left. I would say that that's basically children below the age of two. <clears throat> it's 120,000 children in that city at that time below the age of two. So how many would there be from the ages of 2 to 10? 10 to 18. Boys and girls. 18 to 60. 60 up. Think about it. It's a big city. It's a really big, 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 big city. Now, Nahum prophesies entirely against Nineveh. Well, why does he do that? If the Bible is written to only just Israelites, why does Yahweh send Jonah to save the city Nineveh? Why does Nahum the prophet prophesy to Nineveh for them to repent? When Jonah went to Nineveh and prophesied against them, they repented in the same way that Yisrael would have repented when they repented. If you spend time in the major and minor prophets of the Hebrew Scriptures, you'll find that Yahweh speaks to many, many people, encouraging them to repent. Why? Why would he? If the Hebrew Scriptures were only, utterly, completely, only meant for the Israelite, why would he spend any time speaking to other nations? Why would he spend the time reforming Nebuchadnezzar, the Chaldean king? Nebuchadnezzar wasn't a Shemite. The Chaldeans weren't Shemites. They're Hamites. Anyways. So Nahum spends his whole book prophesying against Nineveh. And it doesn't say a word about Nineveh being on the Tigris or the Hadkul. And then Zephaniah mentions Nineveh too. So Nineveh had to have still been around um, when the remnant of Yehuda, Judah, came back from Babel. 
Babylon. Zephaniah 2.13, he says he'll stretch out his hand against, against the north. <clears throat> you know how many different words there are in the Hebrew scriptures for east, for west, for north, for south. <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> yeah. This one may be um, Tzaphon. It's a real common one. He will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and will make Nineveh a desolation and dry like the wilderness. Now, you don't have to think of desert here because this is Medbar. And I'm not so sure that Medbar is necessarily desert. So there's absolutely nothing in the Hebrew Scriptures that says that Nineveh was on the Tigris or the Hodqual. Nothing. Nineveh could have been an island. I don't know. So we'll go back to Genesis 2. So, all right. No Nineveh on the Tigris or the Hodquil. If they, uh, when they translate the Hodquil as Tigris, that's another one of those examples, what I was telling you about with this chicanery in, in translating. And I told you, you know, I've, yeah, you, I've seen a lot of old sources, old expositors, and most of the expositors that you're going to get on the scriptures are, are guys who have done this within the last five centuries. Let's say, let's say, to be liberal, fine, five centuries. The thing is, for the last five centuries, they've probably believed that maybe Palestine was the land wherein these things occurred. But what nobody seems to mention, maybe understand, is that during the time of Constantine, so it goes, that his wife's mother and maybe he himself had a great deal to do with this. And I kind of think he did, because I kind of think that there was a lot of political motives to doing this. Just as today, a lot of political motives. Certain places, certain areas are very strategic, depending on the empire. So I think Constantine, if it's true about his mother-in-law doing this, that he had a hand in this too. In just summarily naming all of these places. That's what happened. That's why all these places have these names. So of course people uh, expositing on the Bible 500 years ago would have believed that these, these, are, the, these are the places. How long have they been known as this? Powerful empires. People or beings that are focused, dead set on changing the understanding of the world, on history and geography, theology. Science. They can do it. I'm telling you, it's possible. Before you just brush this off like that's insane. Well, it's. I don't think it's that insane. Look at Genesis 2 again. And there's another river that goes out of the garden. And it is the Gihon. And we're going to do a search on the Gihon. Old Testament, please. Not a lot of references on the Gihon. Again, you've got the one that we just looked at, Genesis 2.13. And it says the name of the second Nair, maybe river, sure. 
is gi hun. Gi hun. The same as it that uh, compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. Is that Ethiopia? No, it's Kush. Kush. The whole land of Kush. Why does that matter? Well, here's why it matters. Because Ethiopia is to the south of Egypt. Moses was to the far east of Egypt, where he ended up meeting his wife, Sephora, and his father-in-law, Jethro, and where they say Mount Horab is, or Sinai. That's why they have to make up two kushes. You get it? And they don't stay consistent, folks. Sometimes they actually translate kush as kush. Sometimes they translate, most of the time, they translate kush as Ethiopia. Doesn't this make you kind of mad? It's confusion. All of it. It's all confusion. So anyways, it encompasses the whole land of Kush. So, the next time we see Gihon is in 1 Kings one thirty three. The king also said unto them, Take with you the servants of your lord, and cause Solomon my son to ride upon my own mule, and bring him down to Gihon. And then 1 Kings one thirty eight. Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, okay, they bring him down on David's mule and brought him to Gehun. Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him in Gehun, and they are come up from thence rejoicing. So, um, it's my assumption that what they did was they baptized him. Uh, that, again, is one of the problems with going from Hebrew to Greek, isn't it? Because you say, well, where did baptism come from? It just, John the Baptist made that up? I don't think so. Second Chronicles 32.20 Now, this is where it gets juicy. The same Hezekiah also stopped the upper water course of Gehun and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David. And Hezekiah prospered in all his works. Now, you also have in 3314, Now after this he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gehun in the valley. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I'm sorry, even to the entering in at the fish gate, encompassed about Ophel, and raised it up to a very great height, and put captains of war in all the fenced cities of Judah. Hmm. Interesting. So I'm going to give you uh, the mainline story that is told about this Gehun and Hezekiah and the modern city of Jerusalem and its <laughs> Gehun and Siloam, the Pool of Siloam. And I want you to tell me if that and what we see in the Hebrew Scriptures line up. So the popular story is this, that in Jerusalem, let me see if I can get you some good um, illustrative pictures here. I've got this one page up. It might show you. I want to bring up pictures that uh, show an overhead of the spring in the wall, okay? Here's a, a Google Earth image that has Kidron here. And there's actually a, another valley back here. 
This little lump of ground right here, which covers like maybe eight acres. I said eight acres. This is supposed to be the city of David. Eight acres is supposed to be the city of David. This is supposed to be the place where David came and camped with his armies. And this is not when David was on the run from Saul. This is after David was king, man. He had a huge army. He was supposed to have come and encamped against a little eight-acre lot. And it was actually so well defended, if you'll remember from any of the accounts, if you've read them, that the Jebusites, the Canaanite Jebusites, told him the blind and lame could defend the city. So he had to send, he, he offered a reward to anyone who actually went in and got them into the city. And this man, his general Joab, went in. Now they're going to tell you that he went in a and they're going to tell you he went in an outlet for this little spring. There's this little spring up here that they say that the Canaanites had already built in the old city a small little um, wall around it and that it already ran down, had an outlet out into the valley here. And that that's what Joab went up, I guess, to get into the, the spring here. Um, and I don't know exactly how that would work. My, uh, my assumption would be, uh, if we're looking at this in a real-world context, Joab... Okay, what did he go up? It's hard to say. Was it some sort of a waste pipe? Did he really go up the outlet of this Gion spring? Are we to believe any of these things? It's a little eight-acre bump. Which is where they call the city of David. Eight acres. David, before this time, was staying in Habarun, a massively big city. But he had to have the eight-acre bump. Okay, so this is a decent overhead, and you'll see right here, they, uh, they kind of try to show the Canaanite fortifications that they had, had a bump-out wall that would have been encompassing the, this little spring, this little Gion spring here, and then it ran down and out. Uh, part of the hillside, which, by the way, the Bible says over and over that the city of Z David and Siun are synonymous. It says the city of David is Siun or Zion, Siun. Okay, and they do. They have all these tours, and you can bet they're not free, not if Jews are running them. Of this tunnel. They take them down to the spring. They've got all these staircases and everything built into this rock. And they tell the story about now this is the this is the popular mainstream story about how Hezekiah built a tunnel to bring the uh the Gion Spring. And now this is a 3D of how they think it looked, you know, the bump out in the uh, the Jebusite Canaanite wall for, for the spring, and then it would have been underneath all this rock anyways, and would have exited the uh, the side 
of the hill. This, this is not a mountain. This is a hill. It's a bump. This is supposed to be an old picture from uh, 1900 or so of a little, probably a little Palestinian girl uh, bringing water up out of here. It's just a little spring. Just a little bloopy, bloopy, bloopy spring out of the ground. Okay. And so the story is that in order to fortify the city against the coming Sennacherib, the king of Nineveh, that he set a team about redigging the spring and diverting it to the back side of this little eight acre bump because there's a little valley that runs behind it now remember there's a little valley that runs behind it there's a valley that runs here anyways they build models I might have actually even passed a model they build these models of what they think the city of David looked like and um, oh boy I don't know how he fit all the stuff in there that he would have to have fit in that eight acre bump so they say that what Hezekiah did was that he he went uh, to the the source here all right and the blue here is where it was uh, under the Canaanites and it uh, it led out into the uh, Kidron Valley you see they say been here that he rediverted it all kinds of crazy look at that they were digging in every possible direction to bring it here. They looked, if that's the case, they look confused. Now, what do I think? I don't know. I think it's a possibility that, that this was already a natural um, cut in the earth from this little spring here to this little pool and that all they did was go in and widen all that well here's the problem with them saying that Hezekiah did this and why they say he did it if we go to second chronicles we'd have to go to chapter 32 and they're gonna tell about uh, Sennacherib was I mean he absolutely like decimated the northern kingdom of Israel and carried away a lot of those cities you know, he came down to Judah and Benjamin area and he captured and and carried away a lot of those cities too and he was making his way to Jerusalem and so uh, they knew it and um, they got together and they kind of formed a plan yeah and um, so it says here um, let's see where I can start so I'm gonna have to start with um, Ah, uh, they're gathered much people to get okay, here we go. Sorry about that. And um and when Hezekiah saw it's thirty two two, when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib <clears throat> was come and that he was purposed to fight against uh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city, and they did help. To stop the waters of the fountains. <clears throat> waters is Mayim of the Oin. Oin. These are both plurals. Waters of fountains. Waters of fountains. Waters of fountains. Actually, this Oin, <laughs> this is actually the word I. It's the word that they translate I all the time. So you go figure that one out. 
So there was gathered much people together who stopped all coal, all, <laughs> all ma oin from I, and they're saying all the fountains and the brook that ran through the middle of the land. Middle of the land. Well, the, look, the spring that we just saw, they can't be talking about that, right? Saying, and they said, why should the king of Asher come and find much water? A lot of water, huh? Abundant, rab, abundant. Why should he come find abundant water? There was a lot of water, wasn't there? Interesting. Also, he strengthened himself and built up all the wall that was broken and raised it up to the towers and another wall without. And he repaired Malua in the city of Duid and made darts and shields in abundance. Now, I call it Duid, even though right here it is du de. But if you go over to a lot of the original text, you'll see duid, duid, which is great because I just, I don't want to call David dude, even though everything that I have studied tells me that we've got a du, u, du, dude. But here we've got duid, so kind of more comfortable with that. But it goes on to say that he set captains over the peoples and all that, and then um, Sennacherib's emissary comes down, and there's this whole thing, and it's also written in Isaiah. You can read it there. Now, what's interesting about this is that if Hezekiah had what they say he blocked up the exit, of that, because uh, there was already, they say there was already a natural sort of stream out of this spring, the Gihon Spring, which, by the way, in Genesis 2, it's not called the Gihon Spring. It's called the Gihon, and it's called a Nair, just like all of the others. If Nair is river, I think it is. Do a word study. But I think it is. Not a spring. Now you could say, it's a different Gihun. I mean, you know, is it possible? What's possible and what isn't possible? I like Occam's razor in the sense that if you have a theory and you've got two possible answers to that theory, you're best bet is to always go with the simplest answer. So if we see Gehun in Genesis 2, and then we see Gehun later, and nobody has clarified to us that it is a different Gehun, then we need, I believe, to assume that we're talking about the same Gehun. Now, when Sennacherib's emissary comes down to the city and they are all fortified and they've got weapons and they've done all kinds of work so that they don't have plentiful water outside of the city, what's strange is that Sennacherib's emissary, and I believe his name is Sanballat, if it doesn't say it here, it says it in Isaiah, or elsewhere, it says it in Kings, because this is also recorded in Kings, Second Kings. Anyways, his emissary tells the people, why should you stay in there and starve and go thirsty? That's weird because if Hezekiah did what everybody says he did by blocking up the uh, Gihon, that little spring, it's uh, way of emptying out into uh, the Kidron Valley and actually diverted it back to this pool of Sloam. Nobody would have went thirsty in there. I'm just saying. Why would he have said that?
Nobody would have went thirsty in there. Maybe he didn't know, right? Okay, well, you can say all of these things if you want, and that's just f fine. But here's the problem. After Yahweh sends his angel and kills all of those Asherim, Assyrians, after this, this is when Sennacherib flees back to his city, goes back to Asher, and then his sons kill him. Anyways, this is after all of that. This is after he was going to siege the city. This is supposedly way after Hezekiah would have dug that new and interesting meandering tunnel back to the Pool of Siloam all after this. So the king of Assyria heads back. He gets killed by his sons in the temple of whatever god he had. And it says in 32.23, And many brought gifts unto Yahweh, unto Jerusalem, and presents to Hezekiah, king of Yehuda, so that he was magnified in the sight of all the nations from thenceforth. Now in those days, Hezekiah was sick unto death, and we have this thing here, but Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit, all right, and you, in Jerusalem, notwithstanding, he humbled himself. All right, and there's so there's the incident of him getting sick, and Isaiah the prophet actually comes to him and everything. All right, okay. Then we have the incident of the storehouses and him showing the Babylonians the storehouses and all that. All right. So we've got all of that stuff uh, that's being told about here. And then 32.29, Moreover, he provided him cities and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for Alahim had given him substance very much. This same Hezekiah also stopped the upper water course of Gihun and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David. And Hezekiah prospered in all his works. Let's go back to that image that we were just looking at. This Hezekiah also... Now, this is being recorded a long time after the siege of Sennacherib. This Hezekiah also stopped the upper water course of the Gihon. What are you talking... What... The upper water course? Is somebody going to say, oh, well, that means that he, 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 he stopped up that outlet into the valley of Kidron? Really? Because it says he stopped the upper water course of the Gehun and brought it straight down. Does that look straight to you? To the west side of the city of David. This little eight-acre bump here is supposed to be the city of David. You see this pool of Siloam? Hmm. Go back here, sorry. Ah, uh, Morab, that's one of the uh, many, many words used when you start getting into west, south, east. Straight down, wow. Okay, now, that's not the whole of it, okay? There's more. Howbeit in the business of the ambassadors. Now, this is where the ambassadors. Okay. So, I've got to go to the next chapter. Because I read all of these things beforehand, but there's so many things in so many places. 
Um, no, 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 no. Sorry about that. We'll just actually go back here. Okay. Sorry. It's in 2 Chronicles 33, 14. Okay. Wall without the city of David on the west side of Gahon in the valley, even to the entering in at the fish gate, encompassed about Ophel and raised up a very great height and put captains of war in all the fenced city of Judah. This is supposed to be the city of David. This year, okay? What they're saying, oh fellas, it's supposed to be up here. This ain't straight. This is to the south. Well, you could say, well, he went straight through. The thing is, this is the ta this is supposed to be the tail. And I understand how some of these things seem like they could work. I get it because I thought they could work most of my life. I didn't even think about it. But nobody has clarified that we're talking about a different Gahon than the river described coming out of the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 2. So if you can abandon all of this programming that you've already been given and consider what the Gahon should be. Should it be a little spring or should it be a river? The directions aren't making a lot of sense. A wall to the west side of the city of David? Yeah, you could say this little pool of Siloam was on the west, but not really. The city of David's right here. This is to the south. This isn't straight through. Nobody has indicated that Gion is a spring and not the river. I wonder if you took nearly any, and here's the problem with believing any of the Jews that are over there, that any of these things are, are accurate or on, is that they are deceivers. They're deceivers. Those people that are occupying this place, they're deceivers. And that certainly is not a straight tunnel. So we've got one more, and that's just the fourth river. That's the fourth river that's supposed to come out of Eden, and it's called Euphrates, but it's the Parath. Now, I'm not going to go through every reference of the Parath or Euphrates, but I'll just point you to a few and you tell me if that seems like it works pretty good now the first ones that seem kind of confusing little head scratching is like Deuteronomy 1 7 turn you and take your journey and go to the mount of the Amorites and unto all uh, the places near thereunto in the plain in the hills in the vale and in the south, by the seaside, to the south, the seaside. What seaside? What, the Red Seaside? <clears throat> to the land of the Canaanites. Okay. Oh, so he must mean the Mediterranean. That's really confusing, the way that that's written. And unto Lebanon, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. 
I've got a little map here. This is supposed to be Lebanon here. All of this is supposed to be Syria, Damascus, and all that stuff, right? Yeah. I'm just saying that Euphrates is nowhere near what we suppose to be Lebanon. Okay, fine. Um, let's say I don't understand the language. Uh, that's all right. That's fine. Okay. Um, the funny thing is, Lebanon and Euphrates are mentioned uh, quite a few times together. You know, like they're right near each other. Or that the Euphrates is running through Lebanon or by Lebanon. Not according to... Uh, not according to this map, ain't nowhere near one another. Now it starts getting interesting when you go to like 2 Samuel 8 3. David smote also had a Deezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. Who knows if any of those words are <laughs> very true to their underlying Hebrew. Anyways, as he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates. Which border? You see, this is modern day Palestine, is not rail right here, okay? Look at it. Look at it. Right there. Over here. Over here is Euphrates. Which border are we talking about? Because, you see, uh, David would not want to go straight through right here, this Arabian desert. Ain't no way. You know how hot it gets in the Arabian desert? I, just for a fact, you can't be out there. It, nobody wants to travel through the Arabian desert. And that's what most of this is right here. Unto his border? Which border? Seriously, man, what what border are we talking about way up here uh, in what's now modern day Syria? That that border. If we're talking about the southern part of Euphrates, we've got Chaldeans all over this place and have been for a long, long time. If we're talking about the northern part of Euphrates, we have what they would call the, the Syrians. This really actually, if we want to be technical, should be like more the land of Asher and Ober, Padamaram. So I'm kind of curious. Which border? What are we talking about? You know, like what, what part of Euphrates are we talking about? The border. That he would have chased these enemies all the way to. All right. So then you have a number of uh, references to this Pharaoh Nico, uh, king of Matsurim went up against the king of Ashur to the river Euphrates. And King Josiah went against him, and he slew him at Megiddo. He slew him at Megiddo? Do I got a map? Well, I've got... All right. This is supposed to be a map from 1595 of Palestine. Is it authentic? I don't know. A lot of great forgeries out there, so I really don't know. But um, it's interesting how they kind of cocked this sideways like I did years ago when I did a video on um, directions and maps. I said there's no way that this can be north and south. It'd have to be cocked way at an angle like this. That's, I think that's interesting that it even was. But um, anyways... Megiddo would have to be way north. We're talking about King Josiah. He was supposed to be the king in Jerusalem, in, in Judah, way down here, going way up here to Megiddo, way into the king of Israel's territory, 
because of course the king of Judah could just pop in and out of the king of Israel's territory without a buy or leave, right? All right, fine. So people can debate over that all they want. I really don't care. Again, we have David going to his border at Parath, going to his border at Euphrates. Now here's the one that ought to tweak you a little bit. Get to the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah lived in Jerusalem. That's a fact, Mac. He lived in Jerusalem. And Yahweh says to Jeremiah in 13.4, Take the girdle, no, it wasn't a girdle, it was more like a belt, that you've got which is upon your loins and arise. Go to Euphrates and hide it there in a hole of the rock. All right, that's... Man, that is a long way to go. I'm not sure why I'm going all the way to the Euphrates. I don't know what kind of an object lesson this is. So I went and hid it by Euphrates as Yahweh commanded me. Then it came to pass after many days that Yahweh said unto me, Arise, go to Euphrates and take the... Oh, man, really? That big trip again, that big, long trip... And then 13.7, then I went to Euphrates, he digged, he took the, the belt. Hmm. It's something, man. Jeremiah 46.6. Let not the swift flee away, nor the mighty man escape. They shall stumble and fall towards the north by the river Euphrates. Remember how earlier I kept saying that <clears throat> every time um, the Lebanon was mentioned, and the river Euphrates was mentioned. And here it is again, the north. River Euphrates is supposed to be east of Eretz Israel, right? In the north country by the river Euphrates, Jeremiah 46.10. Hmm. Now he's got to go back to Euphrates again in Jeremiah 51.63. That river's not close, man. Take a look. Ain't close. <clears throat> and I just looked at all the references for the river Euphrates. It's all of them in the Hebrew Scriptures. <clears throat> and the only time that you see Babylon is 46.2. It says... Um, Against Egypt, against the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, it's Matsurim, uh, was by the river Euphrates in uh, Carchemish, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, smote in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Joash, king of Judah. Yeah, that's it, man. You know what I don't see? Uh, I don't see the Bible saying that Babylon was on the river Euphrates, the Parath. Check it out, man. Ezekiel, who was one of the early captives to be taken to Babylon, he says he was by a river, Chebar. Ezekiel very easily went and talked to um, captives that had been carried away from the northern nation of Israel. How was he managing that? If he was supposedly in Babylon here and those captives were taken all the way, way up here. 
just start doing some math on these things. All right, and I've only covered the uh, the discrepancies with those four rivers, and I didn't even get to the Pishon because I told if you get to the Pishon, then you've got to basically uh, track the land of Havila or Huila um, and where it runs. And I can tell you where where it runs. It's it's kind of close to Kush. Kush and Huila are kind of close to Matsurim, which is supposed to be modern day Egypt, and none of the geography adds up. And it takes a close and careful study of these things. I promise any of you, if you want to start studying uh, the, the geography and how the geography doesn't add up, you don't, you don't have to know Hebrew to do it. Um, use a couple of good tools like eSword. And, you know, Blue Letter Bible is really great just for its, its ease of, of the Strong's referencing. Um, you know, and you could use Q Bible too. And just check it out for yourself. Check it out for yourself. Tell me if that geography adds up. Debunk me. I don't care. I don't care. But to me, it, I'm not seeing it adding up. The one ain't the other. So um, I'm looking, and I'm already at an hour 20, so... You know, that's mostly everything I wanted to say about that today. So I do... I sincerely hope everybody really has a great day today. Um, I hope you take care of yourself, your families, and take care of your brother and your neighbor. Bye.